Om Purusham Artam Shunyanam Gunanam Prati Prashavaha Koivaya Swarupa Pratistam Vachiti Shaktihi Iti Om Shantihi 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 That one supreme primordial Shakti force responsible for returning transmigrating consciousness back to its source stripping nature of name and form as she does returns the soul to the state of ultimate emancipation Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Harium, Harium, Harium Tatsat. And that ultimate state of <coughs> liberation is what we've been referring to and inferring for a month of Sundays here when we talk about the subject of rebirth, which is a cycle of birth, death, uh, birth, life, death, and rebirth. It's, you know, if you want to expand it out to its full cycle. Of course, it includes along the way growth, disease, old age, and decay, which are six of the other transformations that come with that package. So when we talk about Koivaya Swarupa Pratista, as I just chanted from the Yoga Sutras by Patanjali, we talk about this final emancipation in which the soul gets freed from all those cycles. So we take recourse to the Divine Mother of the Universe, this primordial Shakti, to help us in that great feat and returning ourselves to this formless state of awareness. This consciousness is an indeterminable mass of pure conscious awareness without divisions. But when we look at it from the standpoint of the mind and its thinking process, we see that this ocean of consciousness has different levels to it. And those are vibrations we look at. Father of Yoga also admits those. The chitta vrittis, the mind is vibrating, the body is doing actions, the lungs are breathing, senses are con contacting their objects. So all of this has to do with this level of consciousness, which you might call, and which my guru called the surface of the ocean of consciousness. If you identify with the surface of consciousness, you get tossed by its waves. I remember him saying that. But if you identify with the depths of the ocean, then you get peace, peace, peace. That peace surpasses all understanding. So <clears throat> this is the ultimate emancipation that the last sutra of the four padas of Patanjali Yoga Sutras speaks about in terms of the Chitti Shakti, she who is the mother of our thoughts. So if, if we can bring in the who question of the five W's this week some, we're looking more at the ultimate solution, not just a solution to forgetfulness. But in the meantime, for, for, for a month of Sundays here, we have been trying to attack the, I hope, already eroding foundations of rebirth with its main problem of forgetfulness. We're calling that Vishmriti on this chart. And last week, we came into mention of the curtain of nescience right at the end of the fourth class. And this is the fifth and final class we're looking into on this subject. So we'll be able to look back on these five classes again and really run this deep into our thinking consciousness 
so that we're not thinking of it as something that is a theory or something that it takes a, a huge immense amount of practice because you think your way in Vedanta. You have to open the, the nadis first in the mind. Just like if you have ill health of the body, you breathe, you eat good food, you exercise, that opens nadis, doesn't it? Channels, nerves, vessels, tubes. And so things can flow through the body. May our life force flow and repeat it, as the Upanishads tell us. So in the same way, in Vedanta, you open the nadis of the mind, and N-A-D-I-S, uh, it's, it's, of course, a, a teaching mainly from the yoga schools, but it, it's very much defined and brought out in kundalini yoga. So I want to, in my preamble today, lead you into this space that we occupied last week. I hope we never even vacated it. I hope we've been thinking about this all week, about how we want to use this knowledge to break through the snap the chains of birth and death in ignorance and feel very assured inside of ourself that we understand this process. It's a part of our knowledge. Take Dhyan Yoga Nugato Pashan, as the Upanishads state, or in another way, say, Nahi Gyanena Sadrisham Pavitram Mihabhijate, as Krishna says, that knowledge is the purifier. So we have to have faith in this. That, it, that just to think something will open it to knowledge. It's not like sitting down and doing a lot of physical asanas, which you hope and that might open some physical nadis. Or it's not like um, breathing a lot, doing breathing exercises. And in that way, you're opening vessels in the lungs and expands and, uh, expanding the power to breathe and so forth. Those are all just preliminary practices that you do for the body and the gross prana. But we're talking about psychic prana here. And if we talk about psychic prana, we want that to flow unimpeded too, so that our mind's thinking process can focus in on in the real, on the real, and, and then uh, that is renounce the unreal. Na asat vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha, the real and the unreal have both been studied by the seers, Krishna says in the Gita. By the way, so I've quoted twice from Krishna already, because John Mashtami is on Thursday this week, so or Wednesday maybe. So we have um, this final class of this series, right, butting up against that great uh, birth date of the Lord Sri Krishna. <coughs> and so he says in the Gita that knowledge is the supreme purifier. So these, these are insights that must dawn on our mind. We can't just hear them and walk away. We can't just hear them walk away and hope that we've understood them. We can't just hear them walk away and think to ourselves, uh, it's just out of a book or it's just a theory. Uh, we have to make this realized. So the dynamics of how knowledge gets digested into the channels of the mind is something that usually you only give to a cross-section of beings called rishis or yogis and so forth. But you must become one of these things. How do I do that? They ask me and I say, you're already doing it. <laughs> you're doing it every time you go into dream and deep sleep. You're, you're moving along this central channel. The central channel, I mean, basically, we've been philosophically tussling with this chart since the first class, and we refer back to it as the end, as we saw in the beginning, and the chart that we had that I help, hoped simplified this chart, because we submit to you how, how forgetful this happens and how we regain it, it are some of these dynamics of... Uh, realizing the Atman within us, uh, purifying the mind, straightening out the thinking process, and honing and sharpening the intellect so that it can penetrate with confidence through the curtain of nations at all levels. So then I, I can ask you to envision then that uh, there's this 
inner freeway that's running to cities. It's called the Shishum Nanadi. It's a central channel. They mention it in the Upanishads. And uh, souls are, many souls are, are not even finding the entrance to the freeway. And it's just, you have to put it that way first. There's what's called a Brahma Grunti at the base of the spine. Now remember the spine is just a physical representation of something inward that we're talking about. When we talk about lotuses or chakras or spandas, these words that are given to these things by the different Indian darshanas, by seers who have seen them inside in their meditation after they have detached from everything external. The unreal went away, the real became, became to become more and more pronounced. Brahman came forward, the world went behind it. And you know, Mammon was, uh, was put aside and spirit came forward and you saw, saw the light and you saw the worlds within. And then you, you traveled them at night anyway when you went into dreaming and deep sleep, but you somehow never got the idea that the kingdoms of heaven are within and that you go there every night. You don't have to die to go to them. You, you, everything is in the mind, so everything is in you. So you don't have to wait for a long time to, for a savior to come or, or for um, the scriptures to show up again in, in an age or for, for Swami Vivekananda to come west again so that people who have been benighted for hundreds and thousands of years and their religions have gotten old and degraded can all of a sudden breathe the light of Vedanta again and drink from this river of immortality that he talks about. So all of this is already going on. How do I do it? You're already doing it. Now just become aware of it. So, I mean, we had answered how last week a bit. Before that, we went to the question, what is it that's transmigrating? Then we went, where is it going? And then we said, how is it doing that? Well, first we said, you know, uh, when is it doing that? Well, all the time was the basic answer. And, and what is that that's doing that? And then how does it do it? And now we're coming closer to a who question. You see, when you, when you look at this inner freeway I'm talking about. So imagine or envision is a better word, this inner passageway that you get on every night. The problem with people getting on it is they don't remember that they got on it, how they got there and how they got off it. And that's called these, this ignorance, this, vid, this avidya. So that the, the memory is not resilient. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, remember. That's why you, they have you practicing svadhyaya, memorizing the scriptures and sotrams and, and uh, opening your mind, clearing your mind, reading the non-dual scriptures. All these things are, are, are really to en enrich you in the knowledge which is already within you. Sri Krishna used to say, in front of the mansion of God, there's this huge stump. And in order to get through the doorway to that mansion, you have to jump the stump. That's how I, I named that story, jump the stump. So this, this Brahma Grunti, this at the root of the spine that people can't penetrate through, consciously is there as a stump in front of the mansion of the kings of heaven within. He said, my father's mansion has many rooms. Sometimes my father's castle has many chambers. Different interpretations are there. So I'm going to have to somehow see that stump as this blockage. Maybe it's even the ego itself that's not willing to ripen and turn around and look inside of the mansion and see all these kingdoms of heaven unfolding within it. Well, this is what the chakras are like inside of this vast roadway called the Shashumna channel. channel. See, it's not just something that somebody made up. It's, uh, souls are going along it all the time. Souls that don't take up any space. You see. And they, and they don't take a lot of time to do this. There's, there's no physical dimension inside. It's, it's all th thought moving faster than the speed of light. Sound, light, those are slow speeds to the yogi. 
He wants to think it and have it happen because it's happening right now. Actually, time doesn't exist. So the eternal moment is something that is unfolding all the time within him or her, the yogi or the yogini. So all he has to do is think it and it will be so. I'm quoting that from Swami Vivekananda. The Vedanta should say that I should think it and it should be so. So if you're not thinking it, it won't be so. <laughs> That's all. So give yourself the credit to be a sojourning soul. You're moving inside through the kings of heaven every night. The one rub is you're not taking your, your memory with you. You see, there's, there's this Brahma Grunti you know, at the very base of the spine. See, that has to be penetrated. So sometimes with beginning asteroids, they'll have you breathe so that somehow the base of that Sushumna will, will develop a fissure, you see, a hole, and consciousness can actually get into it and start moving inward. So I'm describing a little bit to you the curtain of nations then, which we'll, we were looking at last, last week a little bit and, and first class, is that in, in order to, to freely have concourse to this concourse, this great inner roadway, this great freeway leading to seven different great cities, spandas, vibrating vortexes, where billions of souls are collecting there, just like in New York City or, or, or any great city in the world. Uh, but they're collecting there in their subtle bodies, see? So this is the source for what's out here, the Upanishad says. What's internal is the source for what's external. What's there actually is in here. So this is the way they've thought, the way they're thinking, and it follows the mind-only schools and these other things we've been, been learning about. So I described this a little bit in the third or fourth class where souls, if they can get through that Brahma Grunti, then when they pass from the body and cut the silver thread or the silver cord, they come up to the heart chakra to try and get beyond heaven. The, the humans, the elementals, and the ancestors are at three different cities along this freeway called the Shishumna. And souls are coursing up and down it, you see, around the Pinga and the, uh, 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 the uh, Pingala and the, uh, they keep, uh, yeah. Uh, I keep thinking of um, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. This is three Nadis in Western style with Columbus and all that. But the these uh, two nerves where souls are moving around it and getting into the Sushumna and then moving back down to Earth plane, which is at the base of the spine. Uh, we saw from this chart that the mind, this is this tendency of souls to go towards reincarnation. But there are these lower nadis where, where prana-based creatures are coming in and out. They're consisting of prana. You know, if you eat nature all day, eat the green, then you kind of become nature. And then later on, your mind, whatever mind you had, in the case of a cow or a horse, is re be re being reincarnated as a cow or a horse, eating that same green because that was a habit you got into and the prana that you survived on was in that particular substance. So when, when man does not live on bread alone comes along, you find out that the human being doesn't have to just restrict itself to prana that's in food. There's a psychic prana that flows deeper, and you can connect with that through meditation. So the, there are lower births being taken by many of these transmigrating souls. I started off the class today chanting the Yoga Sutra about Mother returning us to our source and stripping away name and form as she does so. So those beings that can give themselves to her, she's their guide on this inner journey up this passageway called the Shishumna. But when they get to this Vishnu Granti, it's the second knot. It's prior, if you want to use the spine again as a physical representation, it's just prior to the heart. It's this elastic band that just shoots them back in reverse, sort of like a slingshot back to earth. 
So they can't get beyond the transmigration loop, which is why I'm bringing this up right now in, in terms of what we've been studying for a month of Sundays. So that's basically this re re reincarnation. This is what's happening in reincarnation with those beings who are not able to use their mind's power, regenerate it so much that it pulls itself out of earth. Were you there yesterday? at satsang when I quoted the Svetashvatara Upanishad, the eminent soul so regenerates the intellect and the mind so that it's able to pull itself out of earth. So that's what it's doing. It's pulling itself out of these three lower chakras so that they can penetrate the Vishnu Granti and get into the heart of the matter. <laughs> Symbolically speaking and literally speaking, this is the heart chakra. There's another Granti up here between the third eye and, uh, and, and the uh, crown, you see, the ultimate destination of this inner highway called the Rudra Granti. Very difficult to penetrate, so only great souls like Sri Ramakrishna talked about. The great Kundalini Shakti wants to meet Parmashiva here, that's how they, they put this. So she's on her way there when consciousness is awakened, but it has to first penetrate the base of the spine chakra and get through that Brahma Granthi and find out that it can flow freely deeper into the realm of the ancestors. Maybe then get to the realm of the gods and goddesses. Maybe then find the Trinity. Maybe then find itself and know that it's been doing this all along. That everything in the three worlds and the four upper worlds have been inside of itself the whole time. And therefore, one stage of the rocket that fell away would have to be getting out of this habit of reincarnation in physical form and in angelic form. So the Upanishads say that again too, basically that um, the uh, heaven aspiring senses, we got over those. It's right there in the Upanishads. They transcended the heaven aspiring senses. That means they did succeed in piercing the Brahma Grunti and getting to the realm of the ancestors. But they found out that heaven was not the highest goal and that it tended to throw them back, you see, like an elastic band, like in the Roadrunner cartoons. You see, the Y-L-E coyote always got tricked by the Roadrunner, you see, hit this rubber band and then you got thrown back. So that's what happened to these souls that's trying to it's trying to get to the heart chakra. If you penetrate through the, that Vishnu Granti, you get to the heart chakra, then there's no more transmigration going on. That's a dream that you gave up, just like you gave up the dream you had last night. It's, uh, it's fast going away. And you're now relocating yourself in the, what they come, call in the Upanishads, in the Tripura Upanishad, the second city of mother, the first city and you got through it, and now you're in the second city of mother, which is her subtle form. You saw her gross form before that. Now you get to her subtle form. And if you are going to go the full distance with um, this inner journey and gain enlightenment, if you're that enterprising and that intrepid, then you can break through this root of Granti and you can uh, merge with her which is what I chanted at the beginning of this class. Purutam artam shunyanam gunanam prati prashavaha. She strips the gunas away. She strips name and form away, even at the highest level, and joins the soul back to its source again. That's the chitti shakti, Patanjali says. So at this point, that's the big who. Who am I? I am her, you see. So Ham, we said yesterday in the, in the satsang. First you say, Naham, I'm not anything that changes. Then you say, Kaham, who am I then? Then you say, Saham, I am she. I am that. And so that's accomplished in this inner journey. And that's the goal of human existence, is to find your way, punch your way out of that paper bag of Maya. You might want to wet it down first to make it a little easier, as I say. You see, what you're, otherwise people are, 
are, are so weak, spiritually speaking, like in today's world, that they can't punch themselves out of the wet paper bag of Maya, even though it's not real. They, they take it to be real. So they just give their pyro, power away to nature. And nature's insentient. It's not going to return anything but this rebirth process to you. It doesn't even give you bodies. You take those from it. And be careful about that, see? Because there are bodies that aren't going anywhere. What to speak of, of suffering in the human condition, that's actually a good thing. Better to suffer in the human condition than to enjoy as an animal. Because that'll drive you on towards bliss, towards eternal happiness and so forth. So I said that would be my preamble describing to you today this inner passageway, the Sushum Yanadi with its grantis, its three main grantis. It's not like there's other blockages there, distractions to have along this inner journey. It's just like out here, get in the car. I mean, let's say you want to drive I-5, you see, on the West Coast. So all of a sudden, you know, as you drive, you come upon three construction zones. They're, they're just hanging out there with lines of trucks behind them, you know, blocked up by them. So that's souls driving along the I-5 inner course of this inner Shishumna, meeting with these Grantis. If you had a consulted mother, she'd say, well, well, basically, you have to be careful for these. It's like getting on the radio, you see, and what are the road conditions up ahead? So this is better not to be taken by surprise by these blockages. Because if you're an aspiring soul, you want to open this up and course freely inward and increase force, uh, um, course freely outward too. That's uh, what Shuram Krishna did, was able to do. I certainly hope the soul is not impeded uh, anywhere or anywhere by its own karma, Vivekananda said. Uh, so it doesn't come up against these grantis, and its karma won't let it pass. See? That's why, and when you study AUM foam, you know that's waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, and you might as well just put the nadis right there. See? These, the, I'm sorry, the grantis right there. See these blockages, because people aren't remembering their dreams. In fact, you're asked to do that in some traditions, and people don't know what happened to them deep sleep. The construction zone took that all away, you see, pissed you off, made you angry, stopped you in your tracks. You had to turn around and go back. So the Shishum Nanadi in an enormous soul is just open. The bird flies free from the nest. The fish is let out of the goldfish bowl into a lake finally. And these are how Sri Ramakrishna described it. And so the curtain of nations is... is um, penetrated. So again, I'm saying when you study rebirth and so forth, do this by acquiring this knowledge of the dynamics of lot, birth, life, death, and rebirth, so that you know that that's going on within you and that you can penetrate it with knowledge alone. My, my guru said some very beautiful things about it, that people can't renounce this world, so um, they, they can't move on from rebirth. But he says, how do you learn to renounce? Jnana Yoga. So he was the first one I ever heard. He was the one that was standing forth back in the 70s and 80s when I was traveling around to different centers playing divine music and talking about Vedanta. He was the only one I saw that had known that Jnana Yoga was the way to do this. Later on, I heard him say, the West has not accepted Raja Yoga because they accept Patha as the method. So he saw that. So he said, the West has not accepted Raja Yoga. If you accept Raja Yoga, the first thing you'll become is a Shakta. The second thing you'll become is an Advaitist. So, I mean, he, he was just so far ahead of his time. I didn't even hear other Swamis of the Ramakrishna order talking in this fashion. So I'm writing a book about this right now. Look for it soon. It's my guru's teachings. How Jivan Mukta looks, you know, uh, in an invited Vedantist, who is a Shakta, because Holy Mother blessed him in his lifetime. 
So this is why the, the deep import of wisdom and meditation, these two great methods. So if you think it, it will be, this has to be your new mantra in SRV for my students who have been with me for four or five decades now. See, this has to be that you have to impress your demands upon Divine Mother. Why is it not working? You're not thinking it rightly and, and earnestly and deep enough. You're walking away thinking, isn't that nice? Or you know, I hope that'll happen to me someday. But you're doing it right now. This all has to be paid forward to an eternal moment. And in the curtain of nations is unforgiving. Your karma and samskaras, as we studied last week on the samskara charts, they're unforgiving. They're insentient, so they're, they're not like going to all of a sudden give you a free pass. This is all you're doing. So make it your doing to penetrate through them. So I hope this is enough of a preamble to go back to this Vishmiti chart, which we looked at last week, uh, at least half of it we looked at. That was the lower half. And I'm impressing upon your mind by repeating these kinds of things to look at this earth and the, the ocean of souls, the stream of souls, rather, that's going towards rebirth. Not only as uh, human beings, again, but can also take animal births. Dream yourself as a plant if you want. You do it at night tonight. <clears throat> so this transmigrating soul, you see, along this river, you might say the Sashumi is flowing along there. You see, this like an inner freeway. All of a sudden, you come to a river that flooded. You see, and you can't pass up the Sashumi Nadi anymore because this Prabhara is there, and you're seeing much of souls going by, waving at you, help, help. I remember in Oregon, the Kalapuya River flooded. My, my family and I were driving, my father was driving. We came up the road in the Kalapuya River. I think they were in Oregon, had flooded over the highway. And we, we watched as a couple of Volkswagens floated by with people waving at us, help, help. They were going out into a field that was totally flooded. And uh, so I'm reminded of that. If you get on this inner nadi, then you have souls that are caught in this samsara pragbara. And uh, they picked the wrong vehicle. <laughs> and it's, they're being swept away by the current. So this ocean of consciousness we talk about is one and indivisible, yes. But people don't, not knowing that it's one and indivisible, are dwelling, are bottom feeders. They're dwelling at the bottom of it. Or let's put it this way, they're tossed about on the surface by its waves. That would be a better way. You see, maybe that ocean is warmer on the surface, so they like the warmth. So they go to the top and they get tossed about by the waves. And in the middle, it's cooler and a down deep, it's cold. So nobody descends to the deepest depths down there. But that's where there's no currents and there's uh, no waves. What are currents and waves? Waves are actions, currents are thoughts. So in this ocean of consciousness, you've got billions and billions of minds doing actions and thinking thoughts, and that keeps them on the surface of consciousness. Oh, oh sparkling, oh, oh soul, you're just a sparkling fish, um, restricted to the surface of the ocean of consciousness, where death is granted, granted his fishing grounds. I'm trying to remember this beautiful song of Rambersad. Quick, dive deep before fish casts, before death casts its net, you see, and traps you again in another lifetime. So you always have to be diving deep in that sense. And uh, testing your muscle against that, those grunties in the curtain of action. So when you do, to move on, we looked at the intrapersonal causes last week, right? I think we made it that far. And those were neglect in taking the teachings. This emphasizes my point right now. We're taking these teachings for some decades now in the Vedanta tradition, 
pay them forward right now, every day. Uh, give up the thirst for the worlds of name and form. Let the mother strip them away and return to your source easily. You can take them on again later in wisdom. You don't have to take them on in ignorance. Some scars are there. We already looked at that. Fixation with families, conventions, caste, and so forth. The illusion of earning, hoarding, and spending wealth, money is there. Clinging to wealth, spouse, and offspring, called famously or infamously the Eshana Triam. Dukkha, believe in the actuality of suffering. I just encountered someone the other day and talked with him. He says, in Vedanta, you don't believe suffering is real, do you? And I said, no, we, no, it's not, it's not real. She said, I'm, I'm not there yet. I, I really think it's real. So I could relate to that, but suffering in yoga particularly is, is to get you to a, a, a place of transcendence of suffering because all bliss lies within you, all peace lies within you. And we've seen souls who have reached there and they don't suffer anymore. Like Sri Ramakrishna had cancer of the throat, he didn't suffer it. His mind was always on the feet of Mother Kali, he said. So he only when he came down and identified with the body did he feel this. But his habit was, or he might put it this way, his lack of habit of identifying with the body and some scars in the mind were all neutralized. So he always remained in this high elevation. Sadurmi, that's the six transformations. Assuming the world to be the only reality, boy, that if you could get over just that one, if you were trying to break through the... Uh, the root chakra, swat, uh, these, into the Swadishtana, to the Manipura. If you're trying to break through that, that Brahma Grunti, if you could just somehow envision that the world's not the only reality, you can leave it for later to realize that it's not even real at all. That might be a big step for most people. It's just a projection. And you're the reality. But for now, you, know, you can envision that there are, there's another reality that's unchanging within me. The witness, you might call it. And then finally, we looked at dull sleep, vacuous thoughts, empty speech, worldly sounds. People are attracted to these, and they run them into the mind. So that's what they're expecting each day and each night, the same thing. It's a good thing Mother put variety here, because we're all doing the same thing every day, all the time. <laughs> same food, but there's a variety of food, thankfully. Same talk, but there's a variety of words, and so forth and so on. So in her grace, she's blessed us with varieties. It's called Vaichitra in Sanskrit. But these varieties can be very distracting and can cause the mind to want, back up to Trishna, can want these things more and more. It becomes habitually to want these things. I saw this on the computer screen going by. It says, some of the dumbest things you spend your money on so I tapped it, you know, rabbit hole style. I said, well, I want to see this, you see. Some of the dumbest things you'll spend your money on, and the picture was a, a, was a pack of hot dogs, you see. <laughs> Why are we still eating these? <laughs> the other thing we know about them. <laughs> I said, well, somebody's beginning to think a little bit, you see. So uh, anyway, <clears throat> vacuous thought, empty speech, worldly sounds, recurring thoughts, uh, it, where's the fresh new? Uh, where's where's the Dharma? Where's the Atmagyan? Where's the peace of mind? Where's the Ananda, bliss? Where's the farthest shore beyond all darkness? So the rest of the class and its end will be taken up here. Uh, so we might as well, because this isn't, I don't have charts to show for this. Um, let's just read the practices here. And remember, these practices are to be done with, I am a Vedantist. If I think it, it shall be. And a caution there, if I don't think it, it will never come about. I've got to really in, you know, invest in it with, with my thought, my faith, my verve, my assurance, based on the, everything that's right and good. My teachers, the guru, the, rish, the scriptures, the ancient rishis. So expand the mind um, to know Brahman. Meditate upon 
the ishtam or form of God. Study the scriptures and memorize. Observe celibacy or at least moderation in all appetites, not just sexual here, brahmacharya and all that, but basically foods, thoughts. You can also, the thoughts are also uh, uh, very promiscuous, you see. So you call the thoughts back, you'll probably call the action back at the same time. So you want to chastise or make chaste your mind of its errant thoughts. Call them back. And what? Focus them on Brahman. So take these all as one teaching. Observe celibacy or moderate. Keep holy company after initiation, which is a two-part thing. Make sure you find the guru. He gives you the mantra. You stay faithful to it. You repeat it to the end of your life. Holy company will be there to help you. Don't abandon guru dharma sangha for any reason whatsoever. And utilize japa of the mantra continually. So at night you fall asleep saying it. Maybe you'll find yourself saying it in your dreams. Wow, that's a great thing. You see, it penetrated. You thought of the mantra in a dream. The mantra is connected to your ishtam or ishvari, the mother. And so she was right there. We have proof of it, you see. It's like stamping your passport. You can go anywhere now. You can go into your dreams as a witness of them. You've done it once. You should be able to do it all the time. And practice the five types of sacrifice. So basically, as you renounce the world, you serve the plants and the animals in it, and those human beings that need help. You see that one of the sacrifices, right? Nara yagya or Bhuta yagya, sometimes they call that. Um, and then you also, although you want to get beyond the realm of the ancestors, you worship them to do that. You appease them. Uh, Buddha left the castle, then came back. Christ left uh, Jerusalem, then came back. See, So they, they go away to get free, to remember themselves, and they go back and give it to people who will listen to them. In this day and age, it's not always families that will do that, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, other people, you'll find, will listen. And that's just two of the types of sacrifice, but you get the idea. Then there's sacrifice to the deities in your mind. You appease them there. There's sacrifice to uh, mankind for their highest good. And then there's sacrifice um, to the rishis, let's see, yogis, seers, saints, sages, those great souls that, that inspire us with their example. There's, there's more further proof if you need it of it. So these five sacrifices you're, you're engaging in, these things will bring your memory back. This will destroy Vishmriti. And all of a sudden, Daivashmriti will be yours. You'll be able to memorize to, to uh, remember thousands of lifetimes back to your source. Could be thousands of lifetimes that you went through in an instant with the speed of the mind, dreaming. And then all of a sudden, you trace yourself right back to Sri Krishna himself, like the Vaishnavas do. Or right back to Lord Shiva, like the Shaivites do. Or right back to Mother, like the Shaktas do. No time has passed. No space is in your way. No cause and effect is too strong to keep you from realizing your true nature because thou art that. You're in your own way, that's all. So let's look then at the final part of the Vismriti class with this collective cosmic and, and cosmic causes. <clears throat> I think I want to read this quote first um, again. Unillumined minds project their crystallized mental complexes into numerous bodies over cycles of time. When, with the exception of souls processing, uh, possessing resilient memories, passing through the curtain of nations between the realm of the ancestors and earth, strips all past life remembrances from them. 
So here's the opposite of what I was just talking about. That come here clueless about past lifetimes. There's no dharma to help you remember them. Your parents weren't raised in it. Their parents weren't raised in it. And then you, at one point you wake up when you're 17, 18, 19 years old and you, and you ask, what's going on here? No, I don't, I'm not down with this. I'm not happy here. I don't believe any of this. Where's God? Why is this world full of suffering? Whatever it is that occurs to you at any level, you waken up to that and you begin to search. And that is very what you're doing right then, is trying to awaken your divine memory to things that you have done and to the reality that you are. So that's a struggle period you pass through. You're, you're trying to cut your way out of the chrysalis you wove around yourself. And this curtain of nations helps you do it. See, winding around all of the things we just described, you know, up here and here. And how you have to cut through them each lifetime. Find yourself to a teacher, hear it again, say, I see, and now I will do. And um, leave this body a realized soul. Become a Jivan Mukta. Become enlightened in this very lifetime. And uh, not take any second best. Forget this little bit of progress. Go right to the source. Be who you are. Let's read Swami Vivekananda here. So this chart will be quite finished by the time our class ends. New thought is telling us to give up our dreams of dualism, of good and evil in essence, and the still wilder dreams of suppression. It teaches us that that higher direction and not destruction is the law. It stops short of nothing but acceptance. It teaches that no situation is hopeless and as such accepts every form of mental, moral, and spiritual thought where it already stands, and without a word of condemnation, tells it that so far as has, it has done good, but now it is time to do better. He used to say that a lot, go from good to best to better. What in old times was thought of as elimination of bad, it teaches now as the transfer, transmigration of evil and the doing of better. Yet above all teaches that the kingdom of heaven is already in existence, if we will but have it. That perfection is already in mankind, if he will but have it, see it. So this is what I'm trying to communicate, the underlying non-dual tendril of everything I'm trying to say about rebirth and final liberation here, underlying is this mind's total positive acceptance and, and proceeding, progressing on this great wisdom of Gyana Yoga and proving it with the meditation of Raja Yoga. He himself did that, and we like to sing about him sometimes. Arindra Chastitai Kalagno Oh, 
live with the verses. Mumuksha darshita. You must have darshan with that free self. Mukti, mumuksha, mumukshutvam. You must have that strong desire to be free. But the verse we just sang, which verse 3, says, Hail to Vivekananda, all excellences abide in me. Your heroic deeds, I'm sorry, yeah, your heroic actions remind us of Hanuman. Your unrivaled detachment marks you as a supreme renunciate. Your music and poetry blend artistry with heartfelt devotion. Your infinite wisdom reflects the state of a Vigyani. Profound inner visions mark you as a great Rishi. In this auspicious dawn of illumination, O Vivekananda, we offer you our reverent salutations. So all of these things found in that perfect soul, as Ramakrishna called him, the perfect man has come in Swami Vivekananda. So we had the Kali avatar, we had the Matri avatar, and we had the perfect man come all at once in the form of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Shisharda Devi, and Swami Vivekananda. And this is what gives us the deepest, highest, most profound, and strongest validation for our position of, of uh, working our way through this illusion of Maya and this appearance of birth and death and gaining our final liberation and then being free as we always are anyway. So read Vivekananda, you can't help but think about beautiful verses like that. Cosmic and collective causes for forgetfulness, which we're now equating with the curtain of nations, right? And this is not something we can fully blame. We have to blame ourselves for our own predicament. But we can say, point to that and say, oh, that's why. Because this curtain of nations is in my mind, and I've allowed it to impede my progress over lifetimes. Other souls are passing through it. They have some sort of wherewithal that I don't have that allows them to become so small that they can pass through it. You know who I'm quoting here, probably when I say that, is that Ramakrishna said about his 16 disciples, back to Swami Vivekananda, he became so great he outgrew the curtain of Maya. <laughs> he just snapped it. All my other disciples became so small they swam through its chinks. See, it's little you know, in, the, in the chain link. Indra's net, sometimes they call it, with a little mirror on each one of those reflecting the worlds. So was, these souls became so small that they could fit through the curtain of Maya. This one great soul just transcended it. So um, beautifully put, and it does point a direct finger at the, the existence and presence of this curtain of nations that is there when people leave their bodies. And it's also there when you go into dreaming and deep sleep. Yeah. It's what uh, flummoxes you. It's what blindsides you. It's what causes you to go unconscious. Consciousness can never go unconscious. That's a contradiction in terms So how is that happening to me? Third eye should always be open. God never sleeps. That kind of teaching, you see. So I must practice this insomnia of yoga all the time. And people say, oh, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I'm going to the drugstore, you see going to have some next sam samadhi tonight. <laughs> no, no, no. If you can't sleep, that's good. Mother doesn't want you to sleep. Just lay there and think about her. Just lay there and do your mantra. Pick up a book, put on a nightlight and read. If you can't sleep. Why are you wasting time? Do everything that you need to to bring back remembrance of your true nature and to destroy this false curtain of Vishmriti that's being pulled down by your own hands, You're pulling a wool over your own eyes. So, cosmic and collective causes, the first one would be vivarta, superimposition of form over reality. So, we'll see through the names and forms of things. Uh, that, that's a great teaching for the Vedantas. Where will you find it in other religions or in other cultures? They're trying to get you to name everything. Then they're trying to get you to enjoy the form of it. Then you're trying to get you to do it in increments of time. And then they're trying to get you to do it at different locations. <laughs> Name, form, time, and space. 
Why are you falling for that nonsense? You are nameless, formless, timeless, and spaceless, and you are without cause and effect. Can't help but sing that, you see, when I, when I hear it. The Abhutit says that very nicely when he sings in his Gyanamritam Stotram. He sings it in a particularly nice way, too. Yatanate hi hridaye na chate samadir Jyanam nate hi hridaye na bahir pradesham Jayam chaneti hridaye na hi vastu kalo Gyanam ritam Samarasam Gagano Pamoham Ganam Ritam Samarasam Gagano Pamoham Just one of 32 verses out of the Avatuta Gita, which you can look up for yourself and read. And he says here, uh, I'm sorry, 42 verses that he has there in that section of the Avatuta Gita. He, he, he says here in the penultimate verse, there is no separate space inside or out in your Atman. So how can there be a place to meditate or a meditator striving to go within? No form can be where no space exists. So who is it that you're trying, to, trying so hard to, to see? In the end, samadhi is just your true nature. You are pure existence, wisdom, and bliss, as boundless as the sky, infinite like space. So here's what a great realized soul will do with these principles or tattvas or concepts of time and space. He'll take them in his mind and he'll just see right through them. There's no outside and inside. When I found my Atman, I could sing you other verses about that that are very beautiful. There's no dimension there. See, all, all that we usually think of in terms of time and space and worlds and people and moving and coming and going, it's all nonsense. There's just this one indivisible mass of pure conscious awareness, and I'm it. So I'm the whole ocean, not just a wave on it, a current in it. Very nicely put by the Abhutud, and there are many more of those verses which we like to sing too. <clears throat> that, in terms of this superimposition of form, name and form over, and time and space over reality, don't buy it. It's vivarta, it's false. One of the first teachings you get in Vedanta, like I said, where else do you find it? Where else are people looking at the world saying, this is all a false superimposition over Brahman? <laughs> or if they are saying, they're trying to get beyond this to some heaven, right? Isn't that what he just said? There's no inside and outside to escape to or from. There's no samsara here to renounce. There's no nirvana there to attain. So Tibetan Buddhists say that. So... You're just winding yourself up in these errant thoughts. Even deep thinking is becoming, is beginning to embroil scientists and intellectuals and so forth. Wrapping it, wrapping Maya around themselves. See? Like a fish, after the fisherman threw his net, it gets down in the mud, it sinks in there, I'm safe, I'm safe, you see. But it's got the net in its teeth. Shmarma Krista said, so false superimposition is exactly what it means. Think about it. Then there's fear of formlessness. I'm just going to show you. Um, well, first of all, before I do that, I'll show you a very good look at the Curtain of Nations. I wanted to make sure I got this in in the remaining time. One of my favorite of these charts
and I will skip the quotes, I think, because this is just, I want you to look at this as divisions of waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and Turiya and Turiyatita, basically. I also put in a visionary state in here, visionary dreams, because there's, there's waking state. Here you see everything that you've learned about hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, earth, fire, water, air, ether, subtle senses, tan matras, all those things that are in the Samkhya philosophy that I've tried to introduce to people here in the West from the Samkhya yoga and how to meditate on them with Patanjali's yoga, Raja yoga, by the way, and then how to get use the Jnana yoga to extract the essence from them. So that's all pretty much in the waking state, and the dreaming state then takes you towards this first line, you see, you see like, like Brahma Granti style. Right? And if you can get beyond that, those worlds, you'll find the Trinity, the devotee feels like God is the entity and the world is another. One, there are two entities here. They're starting to separate the wheat from the chaff. And so false superimposition in Gyana Yoga would be that. You see, oh, I see that's not actually actual. I will, I will discriminate it away. And um, I'll have the wheat without the chaff. So as you move inwards, you find out that waking, dreaming, a visionary state of dreams and deep sleep are all happening here under the auspice of the Mahashakti, Divine Mother. So in a teaching like this, the curtain of nations becomes a filter that's supposed to be there. See? Um, so that souls will realize that they're binding themselves. In the meantime, they're blaming devils, they're playing, blaming ancestors, they're blaming everything but their own thoughts and their own tendencies to be reborn back into the earth to enjoy insipid pleasures ad infinitum over many lifetimes in some sorrow. She didn't want that. So she also uh, knows that high consciousness can't get to itself until it strips itself of that. So back to my first. Uh, Sanskrit sloka at the beginning of this class, she strips away name and form and returns you to your eternal source. See? So this is more towards Turiya. So see here the curtain of nations running through all this, pure intelligence above it. So here is no God, nature, science is God, matter, basically. Here is the devotee's God, Saguna Brahman, God with form. Religion's God. And all of these have a little bit different um, meaning and intensity depending on the individuals. Then here at this level is the Ghani's God, formlessness. You see. So stepping inward is like that. Just like you're waking, dreaming, deep sleep, or just like you're in breath, I, I am Brahman, your held breath will always be Brahman. You're out breath. I'm not the world. And so your breath, your three states of consciousness, the three mantras of Om, the three states of your waking, dreaming, deep, dreaming, dreaming and deep sleep, all of this is culminating inwards for the realized soul, for the soul that's remembering its true self after it's destroying the problem of Vishmriti and getting its divine memory back, Daiva. Shmiti. And it works on that, as we said, in the meantime, and finds out practices it can do. And it knows that there are blocks at different levels of it. Brahma Granti here, Vishnu Granti here, Rudra Granti here, and so forth. And so it's going to have to develop its yogic powers and store them up. That's why you practice moderation or celibacy, for instance, to store up your power and not give it away to nature. It's things in nature. So curtain of nations, you can see this kind of haze is just flowing right on through it. And she stands above and beyond it. She's Nirguna Brahman. She's the ultimate reality. She represents nameless, formless, timeless, deathless, spaceless, causeless, reality. 
That's why sometimes we sing to her. Verses roll on about all the 16 direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna who are her precious spiritual children. Salutations to Vivekananda, to Brahmananda, to Turyananda, to Yogananda, to Abedananda, to Premananda. All of the pictures I'm looking at right here behind the camera <laughs> spread out on our altar here at the Kedarnath Center in Hawaii. So we pay our salutations to them and to her who stands beyond the curtain of nations as the great mother of the worlds and helps her children pass through, whether they become so great that the worlds can't hold them, in the case of Swamiji, or they become so small like minnows or fruit flies passing through a, a screen, a fine screen. You know those ones that get into your house even though you have a screen up? So they're going to penetrate through that screen of Maya and find Mahamaya, maybe do it with the help of Mahamaya. That's the Mahashakti that we talked about the very first thing today in Patanjali's sloka. Vachiti Shakti Iti. So we, we worship that mother of our thoughts. So thought will get us through this. Higher thought. The lower thought, she's waiting for us to awaken. O soul, awaken, awaken, you must. Sleeping, uh, you sleep your way through this life. A beautiful song in India. With eyes open, even in waking state, you walk around blind. It goes on like this, you see. So I must uh, awaken from the awakening state. I think, um, I think I have a God log to put up about that tomorrow, in fact. I must awaken from the waking state. How do I do that, you see? Uh, so this putting into operation all of these wonderful uh, teachings. You do it through Jnana Yoga, and you do it with Raja Yoga. These are the great yogas, four yogas. If you can do that, then you can serve others, Karma Yoga. And of course, Bhakti Yoga, your love for God is intact when you do this. So a, a quick run through Nirguna and Saguna, in accordance with your three states of awareness, actually four if you get beyond dream state, and the curtain of nations that's just there in all of it, even flowing down into the Trinity, you see, because they're still in the realms of name and form. So there's a subtle vestige of that um, line of demarcation between spirit and matter, as one of these Swami Primananda said once, show me that line of demarcation where matter ends and spirit begins. So he was seeing as a whole thing, like the Avatut we just sang about, the whole thing was one homogenous mass of pure conscious awareness. Where is your mind going to vibrate out in it? If it takes on lower things, it's going to vibrate very much at the surface, getting tossed. But if it, if it cuts off the sandbags of lower thinking and growth habits, then it begins to, like a hot air balloon, just soar into the heights of awareness naturally. And uh, 
you should be encouraging this process in yourself, participating in your own spiritual awakening and progress, even though awakening and progress is uh, a dream. So you are already that, as the Advaitas non-duals tell you. You're already that. So maybe that's awakening from the waking state, is to concentrate so deeply upon that one singular fact of non-duality that it just has to dawn on you at some moment. Zen Roshis are waiting for that to happen to their students. See? Teach them for a long time. Why won't they wake up? Why won't they get it? Ah, it's all mother's timing, you see. The mother of the Buddhas will get to them in that case, you see, and awaken them. I'll send them to the next province to do some errand. While they're there, they'll get enlightened. There's stories like that. See? Where the, the diamond cutter, the wood cutter suddenly realizes I'm a diamond cutter. So what happened at that moment? That this old occupation that he did over and over and over again for so long took him to this place where he became in cognizance of his perfect diamond nature and saw it as the most valuable and hardest substance in all the seven worlds. This consciousness that's that's uh, indivisible, indestructible. Akshara, Akanda, you know, they have all these beautiful words for it in our tradition. So um, I, I wanted to flash this chart out. You, know, you can see it in the Footfalls book and take it in more. But, it, but I, I, in that way, you can see how it's pretty much these different levels of souls and how they're penetrating through the curtain of nations. Now, uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, formlessness chart is there. Okay, so basically, the next one of these on our list is Bayarupa. Basically, fear of formlessness. That's here. Sorry for our camera person. I'd have to go back and forth, but if you look at the curtain of nations in this way, you'll see that it, what does it consist of? See, because you're trying to analyze this with your ganem. You see, you're accepting what your teacher says, and that's no problem, hopefully. And then you know, the seers have realized this. The scriptures speak about it. Why am I not getting it? You see, so let's use our powers of analysis and look into it. And look at what some of the greatest beings have said. The luminaries have determ determined that the curtain of nations consists of fear, doubt, and ignorance. Oh, is that all? I thought I had to you know, somehow get a jackhammer and somehow, you know, get through cement to get there. This is how people are thinking with their uh, physical yoga regimens and their huffing and puffing and so forth. You see, their psych psychotherapy that gets them nowhere. Uh, it doesn't get to the root of the problem, see, which is false superimposition over name and form. Where did you ever hear a therapist tell you that? Oh, your problem is... <laughs> no, they're just going to send you back to the confused mind from where you came from, maybe thinking that you have an upper hand now, but you don't because Maya has got you. You're a fish stuck in the mud with a net in its mouth. The only one thing is going to get you free of that, and that's this highest wisdom and your meditation on it, Gyanam and Rajam. So basically, they tell you, we looked at it, and we saw it in your mind. Guess what it consists of? It consists of your fear, it consists of your doubt, and it consists of your root ignorance, your mulavidya. Can you find those and get rid of them for me now? So I can see you enlightened, and I can go on and fry the next fish? Your dish is still in the oven. Let's get it cooked take it out and enjoy it. So these things are nothing like rocket science. If you take them apart, the, the fear is of death and why I just said here, of formlessness, right? We, we fear formlessness, but yet we go into it every night in deep sleep and get our best rest there. That doesn't make sense. We give ourselves into that like a fish into a goldfish, let out of a goldfish bowl, give ourselves into that. 
I embrace formlessness. He whom misery loves and hugs the form of death, to him the mother comes, Vivekananda said. So you drink the deep waters, Ram Prashad says. If I can't have your vision, O oh mother, I will jump off the ship of this body mind mechanism into the ocean of samsara with my mouth open, and I'll drink the deep waters of death. That's how powerfully oriented they are to seeing through this false superposition and getting rid of this fear of form, form, formlessness. And suffering, as I said earlier, you know, that has to leave the mind. That if you know, if you knew how much your suffering means to you, you wouldn't ask me to take it away. Padre Pio said to one person, you see, don't ask me to take away your suffering. If you know how much it meant, means to your spiritual life, you wouldn't ask me to take it away. You'd look into the Raja Yoga, Patanjali, and he would tell you, face off with your suffering right now. This is a good thing. And it, whereas uh, pleasure, well, okay, I can't help you with that, you see. I can help you with suffering, because I know how to instruct you about that. But pleasure and attachment to that, why did you ever get stuck in that in the first place? I can't help you with that. Give it up. And fear of other entities. I mean, that's what's causing the world right now to go crazy, is everyone's fearing everyone else. There are some real asuras in the mix right now. The world is full of asuras. That's demons in human form. The asuras usually inhabit this level of things, you see. The elemental, that second chakra, third chakra, you know, in the freeway, you'll have to pass through them. Like, you know, the demonic um, influences, uh, wrathful deities, they're called in some traditions. If you go along that inner freeway, you'll, you'll probably see some of them along the wayside. Some of them might even get in your way. And that's where you'll have this power with the mantra. I shall, you know, let me pass. Om Sharda, Om Sharda, Dry Sri Ramakrishna, Om Sharda, let me pass. I can't bear to hear those words. And they run away. See? And, and you go on coursing within. See? So other entities are there in the world, causing war, causing violence, with en enmity. That's, that's, uh, Hard to believe, but this is what they do. They're in the mix to make it all more interesting. <laughs> That's what Sri Ramakrishna said. So you can see how much he's over suffering and how much he's over Vivarta, right? I mean, if you said this to a person just in a conversation, they say, you're crazy to think that way. These are real. Suffering's real. These wars are real. People are really suffering this. But you go to an illumined soul and he says, it just makes everything more interesting. What's that mean? Where's his mind see, when he says that? Uh, they, they help stir things up. They get people moving, you know, to, because suffering needs to be transcended. So you, that's one way of facing off with it, is to come upon these demonic forces and just look them in the eye and realize they can't hurt you. Nothing can destroy the Atman. Go back to your Gita, second chapter, right off the top. Water can't drown it. Fire can't burn it. Arrows can't pierce it. Spear can't puncture it. That's your Atman he's talking about, you see. That's your birthless, deathless nature. And uh, you've covered it over with too many false superimpositions, you see. So anyway, going through the curtain of nations here, there's fear, then ignorance of yourself. I mean, if you could put that one to rest, all the rest of this might just be like little bubbles around a big bubble. They just pop. Then what else? Of non-dual truth. It's almost, almost the same thing, saying the same thing. As you align yourself with, with I and my father are one, or I and my mother are one in Shaktism, then half the battle is over, you see. That's his remembrance. If a, a thought like that is planted in your mind, 
then that's really great. A man has come to me from a land that never sleeps. Now all my dreams have become radiant meditation. So what happened when he met his guru? His guru said a few words to him about false superstition and about about your true nature being Atman, not the world. And all of a sudden that seed was planted. That was spiritual awakening right then. And it was just a matter of time before that soul fully awakens to its divine nature. One lifetime. It's not too long for that to happen. You hear about it happening immediately. That's for some pretty high souls probably with really great teachers <laughs> like Sri Ramakrishna and Swamiji. And there are stories about it, of course, in different traditions. So what else is you're ignorant of? A series of births. Well, doesn't that fit here? Uh, and then of Dharma and divine life. Here's your gradual emancipation, you see. Uh, if you're resisting her taking you by the scruff of the neck and just vaulting you into these higher realms of consciousness, even Sri Ramakrishna said, she made me sit when I contacted her. That's Mother Kali came to me. She locked my knees. She knocked my elbows. She locked my shoulders, and I couldn't move. She said, I actually heard them being locked. And she wouldn't let me move for long periods of a time. So if a great soul like this has to have that experience, then how much more are we going to have to have such experiences and become very determined to sacrifice herself to her 100%. Not 99.9, .9, she won't accept. So this is why she gives a little concession here. You see, basically, practice the Dharma and learn how to live a divine life. Enlightenment will come quicker that way. Finally, of revealed scriptures and guru. There are so many people who don't have that awareness yet. I remember my own teach, teacher, guru, standing there saying, looking at the Western audience. I'm speaking to the Western audiences here. Here in America, the guru is not popular. Why is that? Because the church has taken its place. Did you ever hear a priest talk to you about the curtain of nations or your true nature being sinless? That thou art that? That the whole world was a false superposition, including the church over God? that everything here was insentient and that your true nature is formless? Did you ever hear any of that ever taught to you or your parents? If it ever was, did they realize it? Or to what extent did they realize it? Did they pass it on to you? Did they know how to transmit it like your guru does? And like the scriptures will in the light of your guru. So going through the curtain of nescience, this is what is in your way. You see, what else is there? Shiva, in the Shiva scripture said here, and I didn't finish it. All of this is maintained and thickened due to the mind's brooding on the effects of these primal causes. So it's not just that these are there. When they come up, you know, you brood on them. You brood on death. Shankara says that when you get older, a man broods on death. Uh, brood on formlessness in deep sleep. What happened to me? You see, or I got knocked unconscious, or I got sick and went into a coma. I was formless. What happened to me? So you could sitting around there brooding on it instead of saying, wow, that was great. What an experience that was. I think I'd like to have that again, particularly in meditation. That's why I've been practicing meditation for 10 or 20 or 30 years, by the way, is to have my first experience of true formlessness. Conscious deep sleep, if you want to call it that. Um, so don't expand the curtain of nations by brooding. Thin it out by thinking, by using your mantra, consulting your guru, reading the scriptures, obtaining jnana yoga, and meditating with raja yoga. Get a method, get a formula, and put it into place right now to the last breath. From cradle to the grave, cradle, cradle to the grave, you've got to do this. This is the one most important thing of my existence is to keep this maintained. Everything else has to fall behind it or go away completely in some cases. 
So what else did you say? Fear, doubt, and ignorance. Let's look quickly at doubt. Um, about divine reality. Well, of course, that's, that's weakness. Weakness is atheism, according to the Ramakrishna order. That's just weakness. To not believe in divine reality is foolishness. It's all around you. You're it. And then you deny it. And then, oh, how are you going to get out from behind that eight ball? Nobody ever says, I'm not. I'm not. They always say, I am. I am. So this is where I'm not has to stand aside or be best used as neti neti in our tradition. Naham, I'm nothing, nothing that changes. That's actually a help. But it has to come down to this saham. I am that. I always have been that. I will never be nothing but that. That with a capital T. Tat Tomasi. So, <clears throat> doubt about divine reality doesn't make sense to the seers. Doubt about formlessness being in existence. You just have to think about your deep sleep state and people's death. People with near-death experiences have met formlessness. About the purpose of life, there can be only one purpose of life, and that's to realize God. That's why you've come here. There's no other purpose than that. All the other purposes are secondary to that. A, zero, a line of zeros adds up to zero. <coughs> and that's all the experiences you've had here if Brahman isn't put as the one in front of them. Or your ishtam, like mother. So put her first. And that goal first, that's the primary goal. That's gatam, gatam, par gatam. I'm going beyond these goals, family, house, riches, so forth and so on, in the Dharma, see, so that I can get to this penultimate goal of um, koivalya, allowing mother to strip name and form away from me and reveal to me my the light of pure conscious awareness, which is within me which is underlying everything. It's shining like a great gem. So the purpose of life, not a hard answer, to, a question to answer in Vedanta. Uh, about the presence of Maya, that's harder. Most people won't see it. Like I said, it's, it's right back to Vivarta. You can't look at names and form. People can't look at them and say, oh, there's Brahman behind that. There's vacuous space behind it. If you burn the wooden chest, then there's no, nothing there but space and some ash. But fire cannot burn it. Water cannot wet it. You, know, you have to look beyond the names and forms because those are false superimpositions by your mind over reality, which is you. Isn't that a strange thing? that you yourself are constructing these worlds of name and form and putting them over your own self and forgetting yourself in the quotient. This doesn't make sense. Unless you're playing a game of masks and you're pretty good at, at ripping them off at some point. There are souls probably who do that. Well, about the emptiness of form, I mean, because now we're getting into the deeper analysis, you see. If I can look at the emptiness of form, like in the... Uh, Diamond Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, the famous quotient there, uh, then I, I can begin to get at this subtle most of dualities. Subtle most of dualities called form and formlessness. And then go beyond both. Go beyond them both. Sanyasan bo, seom tat sat hom. So a quick look at Curtain of Nations uh, coming from a chart that we won't be able to finish in this class, but we did get through three quarters of it. Maybe I can read the rest of these just so that we can uh, finish with a sense of completion. That is basically doubt in the nature of the self, samshaya, belief in change and transformation. I had a chart on that to show you about aparinama, how aparinama is belief in change in the West. West has that stuck in their mind. Our savants, our wisest Western intellectuals, have it stuck in their mind that uh, that, any, that things that the transformation is real. But Brahman doesn't transform. It's the one thing they haven't seen. 
samsara, belief in birth, life, and death. Well, we just, in five Sundays, I think we just disproved this. See, that there's something that's birthless, lifeless, and deathless, and rebirthless that's witnessing this whole thing. So we need to focus on that with these methods. Giving over this desire for heavenly existence, which is one of the traps of fundamentalist religion. Science has one problem, religion is the other, and the two are warring against each other. By the way, science won that war. Uh, Congress passed, passed a law some decades ago that we believe in evolution now, we believe in science, we don't believe in religion. So those who were the church fathers got left out in the cold, you see. And since then you see them all, the church is deserted and people abandoning religion, which has a very negative side to it, but it's not all bad. One of the bad, bad things that's coming along is that we believe now in evolution with no involution. And my teacher attacked that all the time. Shankara, his philosophy was non-dual, but he believed in involution, if there was an evolution. So Advaita also comes along. And even though that's change, it's talking about has to be two movements to it. Like this, this freeway up you, you see, up the middle of you. This, this Sashumnanadi, you have to be able to get up and down both. And finally here, the influence of the ancestors. I would have had more to say about all of these things, but we have run out of time for this class. And next Sunday, of course, I will be on my way almost to the Portland Ashram so we can have this very beautiful um, retreat on dissolution of the mind stream, which is very close to this kind of teaching. So these five classes will have set you in good stead if you're coming to that retreat in Oregon called Dissolution of the Mind Stream in nine different darshanas, count them. See. Uh, and we will sit there for three and three and a half days and go through that in depth with a, a good group, a good sangha who's already signed up for it. So we, 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 could, we probably will look at some of the rest of this chart or some of the teachings about the curtain of nations there. It'll be inevitable when we take up the Vedanta darshana. And, and show how dissolution happens through that particular philosophy. So here then we must state, <clears throat> let darkness go, will of the wisp, that leads with blinking light to pile more gloom on gloom. This thirst for life forever quench, it drags from birth to death, death to birth of soul. They conquer all who conquer self, know this and never yield. Sanyasam bold, say om tat sat om. I say peace to all, no danger be to aught that lives. From those that dwell on high to those that lowly creep, I am the self in all. All worlds, both here and there, do I renounce. All heavens, all hells, all earths, all hopes and all fears. Thus cut thy bonds, sannyas and bold. Thus be thou calm, sannyas and bold. Say om tat sat om. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tatsat.